So I've been doing drug driving for about two years uh, uh, now. Um, and I'm the lead uh, uh, policy, pretty well doing it on my own with some support from a few others. Um, just to give you uh, some context, we've had an impairment law since 1930. The, uh, it, under the influence of drink was actually 1925, and drugs was uh, added in 1930. And it's largely remained unchanged. And the drink driving limit was set in 1967, uh, following the Grand Rapids uh, study with a limit set at 0.8. Um, so we've set the drug driving limits in 2014. It was passed uh, by Parliament on the 13th of October, so just a month ago. And it will come into force on the 2nd of March next year. I should point out it's England and Wales only. Scotland has the same offence, but they haven't uh, done their regulations to specify the drugs and the limits, and there's no time frame. I think they were preoccupied with a certain <laughs> referendum. Um, so how and why did we get there? Uh, so Peter North uh, was asked by the previous administration to do a review of drink and drug driving. And he concluded that there is a significant drug driving problem, and he recommended introducing a new offence. Um, he suggested that, if possible, to try and set uh, road safety risk-based limits that are in line with the excess alcohol offence. Um, just looking at uh, to what extent it is a significant problem, our official statistics are the contributory factors, which typically show that it's about a third of impaired by drink. Um, however, uh, it's we know that's probably likely to be an underestimate because testing for uh, alcohol has got much far greater capability. Um, at the moment, uh, the figures seem to have dropped uh, a lot down to about a quarter, so only 36 deaths in Great Britain. Uh, but if we uh, consider some other uh, methodology of, of study of that, because the problem with contributory factors is that it's down to the police officer at the time to make a subjective view you might not always make the right uh, judgment. Um, looking at uh, sort of the Druid's uh, estimate that it's uh, roughly about a half of uh, uh, the uh, prevalence of uh, excess alcohol, it could be 105 deaths. And on a transport research laboratory uh, report where they actually worked with one police force, they found that it was actually evident in 18%. So it could be as high as approaching 300. Um, as well as Sir Peter North, I really want to bring your attention to Lillian Groves, who's the girl in the top right-hand corner. She was a 14-year-old girl. She was killed outside her home by a speeding motorist. And he wasn't tested for drugs at, at first. It only came to light later when they found a couple of spliffs of cannabis. And uh, he only uh, served uh, eight months in prison. Had we had the new offence... Uh, We've amended the uh, uh, primary legislation so that if you're over the specified limit, even if you might not be impaired, uh, they can prosecute you for causing death by dangerous driving under the influence of drink or drugs, and the sentence uh, can be as up as up to 14 years. So he would have served a much heavier sentence. So the Groves family have been campaigning very successfully. They've got the support of their MP and their local paper, and crucially, they got the support of the Prime Minister, and they met him in November 2011, and the Prime Minister uh, pushed the legislation through, uh, and, well, we had to have it introduced in Parliament by May 2012, so within six months of him meeting the Groves family. So they've got the ear of the Prime Minister, and whenever they write in, they get a personal response from the Prime Minister. So uh, that's what we're working under. Uh, I should say, fortunately, they live not too far away from me, and we both support the same football team, which really helps, so uh, um, so we get on quite well. Um, so prosecution of drug drivers is currently only about one-fiftieth of drink drivers. Um, as nearly half of cases get withdrawn or dismissed, because uh, uh, police officers have to prove that the person was impaired, his driving was impaired, and that impairment was caused by a drug which is sometimes quite difficult. So the existing Section 4 impairment offence is not alone uh, 
effective. Um, we're keeping it, it's maintained, uh, but the new Section 5A offence. So the Section 5 offence is the excess alcohol, and the Section 5A sits alongside it with the same penalties. Um, the framework of the new offence, um, so as I said, we got the power to specify the limits and regulations, which we've just done, and Scotland to be confirmed. And it's got the same um, penalties available as the uh, excess alcohol offence, so that's disqualification for 12 months, fine up to £5,000 and up to six months in prison. And do not have to prove impairment, it's just whether you're above or below the per se limits. The key point though is the statutory medical defence. Uh, the medical profession well, really didn't like this new offence, particularly as we're including some medical drugs. And the pharmaceutical companies really lobbied hard against it because they feared that people would stop taking their medicines and would be a hit on their profits. Um, so this medical defence was introduced, uh, which seems to have satisfied or taken away some of the concerns. So government and parliament has seen fit to protect these people. Um, so what drugs to specify? Dr Kim Wolfe, who's an addiction reader at King's College London, chaired uh, this expert panel and asked to provide which of the drugs looking at the evidence uh, in the UK and on the limits looking at uh, evidence from around the world. Uh, they used the odds ratio uh, risk-based estimate and they were asked to, uh, within that uh, uh, statistical concept was to see if they could set those limits uh, equivalent uh, to what the North report suggested of an excess alcohol. Um, so they provided recommendations and their road safety risk-based limits. And then um, the Prime Minister, or well, Number 10, stepped in and said, this isn't what we want. We don't want risk-based limits, not for uh, uh, illegal drugs. It's going to be in conflict with um, the Misuse of Drugs Act and the overall drug strategy. How can we say that um, it's OK to drive on illegal drugs as long as you don't have too much of it? That's not what we want at all. Um, so we, we had to sit on this report, and you probably know there's a code of conduct when you get scientific advice about what you do with it. So you might uh, want to know how policy responded to this sudden uh, intervention by number 10. It was a bit like that. <laughs> Where do we go from And this is actually the point when I joined the team. I, as uh, Ross said, I'd previously been doing Olympics, a bit of Olympic legacy, at this point, the policy person left, um, and I'd previously worked for the director of road safety before, and she said, got a big problem, had a massive rail with number 10, uh, they won't let us publish the report, can you come and uh, help sort us out? She really knows how to sell the job. Um, but I thought, well, let's go for it. Um, so the first thing I considered was uh, the European Court of Human Rights, so it might be similar to your Bill of Rights, because if we're suddenly taking a zero-tolerance approach to all the drugs, this is including medical drugs, then we might engage Article 8, which is the right to privacy and family life, basically a quality of life. Um, in a democratic society, it's quite reasonable for the state to protect its citizens from the threat of, in this case, drug drivers, but it should be proportionate. So if you're taking a zero tolerance approach. Is it disproportionate to the problem when the risk-based approach should do the trick? Um, so I thought the first thing I've got to do is try and get number 10 out of this uh, approach to the zero, uh, zero tolerance to the medical drugs. So I spoke to the minister, who's a very sensible, pragmatic chap, and he said, does the prime minister really want to take a zero tolerance approach to uh, medical drugs, isn't he really after the illegal drugs, the cannabis, cocaine, heroin? He said, well, I flipping hope so, because I'm on some of those drugs myself. So uh, um, so with that, I said, well, let's go and have a chat with number 10. So I spoke to the officials, and they actually agreed, yeah, actually, we don't need a zero tolerance approach to the medical drugs. It's just the illegal drugs we're after. Um, however, I should point out that um, some of the zero tolerance approach drugs uh, are used legitimately for uh, medicinal purposes. So uh, there's still a 
possibility that we could be challenged under the Article 8. Uh, one of the examples is multiple cirrhosis and the use of Sativex, which is a legitimate medicine, could be prescribed, but they could use the medical defence. So we've just got to make sure that nobody is deterred from driving or from taking their medicine. So lots of medical advice. Uh, top down is on your left. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that healthcare professionals read. Bottom up is the kind of stuff that patients read. So PIL being patient information leaflets, they've all been amended. Uh, DVLA letters, so driver vehicle lic license and agency. Uh, when somebody has a condition like say MS, it's, they have to notify the DVLA. They will take a medical examination. If they're fit to drive, um, the DVLA would write back to them and notify, give them one to three year license and say, make it clear to them that there is a medical defense. So if they're ever driving on, uh, well, get stopped by the police in relation to the driving to uh, provide the statutory medical defense to provide evidence so reduce the inconvenience. Um, so that's some of the stuff. I won't go through it all. I haven't got the time. So finally, these are the drugs and these are the drugs and the limits. Um, so split them into two groups, uh, and we tried to dig out as much evidence that we could to support a zero tolerance approach. And the transport so the committee says something quite um, useful for us, and it was actually quite well supported. Um, people thought it was a well-balanced and pragmatic approach. And even a Satifax user, who has MS, said this seems entirely reasonable. So hoping that Article 8 won't be engaged. Um, but there's still problems, still lots to do by the 2nd of March. Accreditation of forensic service providers. This was another bit of a scream moment because uh, they currently only look for presence. And they have accreditation to, uh, to do that. But they don't uh, have, um, and they had scope to use validated and verified methods to look for specified limits. And the Crown Prosecution Service said, no, we want them fully accredited. And when we asked the UK Accreditation Service, how long did that take? They said, oh, about nine months. Um, so we probably would have started it last month. So we've had to start it on the 2nd of March. Margin of error, uh, making sure we've got analytical certainty beyond reasonable doubt. We're going to use three times standard deviation. So. The trouble with uh, looking for drugs, it's much more difficult than looking for alcohol, as you all know. Um, uh, just making sure that the suspect is provided with the correct advice, so it must be uh, refrigerated at all times, and the police treat their samples correctly too. Sometimes police officers have been known to put their sandwiches in forensic fridges. Um, so none of that, please. Um, we've got to amend the forms and type approval of mobile screening devices. Uh, they will be ready. That's actually going uh, to track. We should have cannabis and cocaine devices ready uh, in January. Uh, and for, uh, no evidential alternative blood is something that's a concern for the police. They fear that um, suspects will claim that they have needle phobia and they can't give blood. Uh, and therefore, they're going to still collect evidence of impairment, which means they're not going to use the mobile uh, oral fluid preliminary screener, screeners at the roadside to begin with. They want to see if any of these problems emerge. Going to use them at the station to gain confidence. Um, just quickly, obviously, we've got a Think Publicity campaign. This will probably be familiar to you as male skew, uh, 17 to 34 years of age, will be our target audience. Um, their drug life is, uh, um, uh, is often separate from their normal life, so their work won't know about their drug use. Family, in most cases, probably won't know, and even some of their friends won't know. So that could all get exposed. Um, we've actually managed to get a focus group of drug drivers, and uh, the third uh, bullet, they were actually really shocked and concerned with the new offence about driving under uh, the penalties that were available and that they could get detected much more easily and all that exposure. So that's our hook. And some of the propositions that we're looking for is something like one lick and you're labelled. Um, um, tricking yourself is easy, but tricking the police is harder. So we've got to try and get from there to there. Uh, is it already deterring drug drivers? Um, there's the Crime Survey of England and Wales. 
It's a self-reporting and it's anonymous, but it seems to be going down. Uh, we can't be sure whether it's due to the actual uh, quite considerable media coverage that we've had in just introducing the legislation. When I did the consultation, uh, we were front page of the London Evening Standard, so we got quite a lot of coverage. So um, it's possible. If that is true, then we've already taken around 270,000 drug drivers off the road, um, and we haven't even started the offence or the campaign. Um, so lessons learned, be clear about what your politicians weren't, uh, want, manage expectations, it's a lot more difficult, less of the screen, more of drug detection, check what your lab uh, laboratories can do, see how accurate that they can, uh, measure to what's your standard deviation, check with your prosecutors what approach you're going to use, um, work with police obviously, and go back to the politicians to say what is achievable. How close can you get to their desired outcome? Um, and if you get public support through public consultation and you've got the will of Parliament, then it's quite unlikely that anybody would be able to challenge you under the, any Bill of Rights or human rights legislation.